I appreciate his presence always being with us. It's especially nice when you can actually sense it and feel it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tim. Great job opening. Appreciate it as always. Suzanne, Tammy, Peter, thank you guys for leading the worship. Eric, thank you for thinking for me. And Mike's pushing all the right buttons, and Peter's getting ready to do the thing up there, so praise the Lord. It's all good. Amen. Happy New Year, everybody, a few days early. Looking forward to 2020 and all that God has for us. Praise the Lord. Hope everyone had a great Christmas. I want to thank everybody for the generous gifts and well wishes and cards that uh, you shared with Sally and I. We're, we're really very, very grateful. I hope you realize it. it really does mean a lot. It's not just that you gave, but it's the, the heart behind it, and we really do feel that and believe in it. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. I was just thinking, Velcro, what a ripoff. <laughs> How many of y'all watching? I, I, I got to tell you, I don't watch news hardly at all, except when Sally forces me to. But um, all this stuff with the impeachment and all this just crazy stuff. I was thinking the other day, I was wishing that there was a knob on the TV to turn on intelligence. Because <laughs> there is a knob called brightness, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Crank that baby all the way up, and it's still stupid all the time. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And I guess part of it's just one fifth of people are just too tense. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, speaking of tense, past, present, and future walked into a bar. It was tense. <laughs> well, you're really making me work this morning. Praise the Lord. I'll share, okay, I'll, I'll quit with this. I'm going to share my theory on inertia. It just never seemed to gain any momentum. <laughs> it can get worse, praise the Lord. And these are the good ones. I picked out the good ones for you guys. But I'm really grateful for uh, the testimonies for Tim's opening, because I'm telling you, it is yeah. spot on with what yes. God's talking to me about, the things that Don shared. I, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how that same spirit is in all of us and leads us in the same directions, and it's just crazy. I mean, it's crazy good, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's always exciting to, you know, you spend time with the Lord and try to come up with what you feel like he's saying and wanting to say, mm -hmm. and then to have that validated in a lot of ways because of other Christians, because of other believers that uh, have the same spirit, you know, so it, it, yeah. it works that way, and it, it's always encouraging to me, so if you don't like this message, blame Tim, praise the Lord. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I would like to start 2020, you know, we've all heard it, it's become cliche almost already that uh, it should be the year of perfect vision, you know, and so on and so forth, so uh, who knows, Debbie, maybe that's a challenge. Yeah. You know what I mean? I got, I'm dealing with the same thing. So I, every time I have this thing pop up on me, I'm going to remember you and say yeah. we are healed in Jesus' yes. name. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So thank God. I want to begin here. Let's start with uh, uh, Romans 16, and we'll read verses 24 through 27. I really do believe, and I know it's a new year, and we all, like Tim said too, we all want to kind of think of new things and stop old bad things and start new good things and all this, but the truth is, I just really do feel like there's something special about this year that God's wanting to do in His people, praise the Lord, and in the church, and that's what I'm looking forward to, and that's what I'm expecting, so yes. it's that expectation that uh, God challenges yes. and pays off, amen? So, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, a 
according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15. 1 John 5, 13 through 15. Praise the Lord. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire. And lastly, Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in the order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Praise the Lord. So I honestly believe that we are in a divinely ordained uh, move of God. And uh, it's founded on all the truths and the spiritual experiences that have been restored to the church during the last 500 years of the church's restoration. It's a, it's a Holy Spirit-inspired restorational movement and I believe it's predestined by God for the fulfillment of his ultimate purpose and for his church, his children, and planet Earth. Yes. And it's bringing about the final fulfillment. And listen to what I'm saying here. The full, final fulfillment of all prophecies or all scripture. You know, it's weird because... Don, you've remarked on this before, and I've thought a lot about it, too. In the fullness of time, God sent forth. What, what, what is the fullness of time? When the hunger was so great and the need so much that it reached a place where God said, now, you've got to do something. And it's true with the flood. It was true with so many things throughout the history of humanity. And I think that's where we're approaching, the fullness of time for this, for this to be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. It's, it's like a second coming of Jesus because he is the word. Now, we know he's coming physically, but I'm yes. talking about manifestation yeah. here. Yeah. And so uh, we know in these days the world will become more wicked. We're seeing it every day. Yeah. If you've lived more than 25 years, it's gotten uglier and meaner and nastier since you were a little kid. Yeah. Turn on the TV and I, yeah. I think of Tim, you know, yeah, hee-haw. And, and uh, you know, the, the old uh, Lone Ranger and yeah. Tonto and Roy Rogers and... Superman and all these shows that actually validated Christianity. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, they actually came right out and said it, you know. Yeah. And that's why it's so, so cool. I was watching football games yesterday. Obviously, we had a yeah. family get together with Christmas and stuff, but we, I was catching bits and pieces of it. And, you know, when Dabo, mm -hmm. he wasn't just dabbing, <laughs> but he's praising the Lord yes, for their victory, giving glory to God. Now, you can say that's trite, but listen, that takes some guts. Yeah. This is college. Yeah. Th these are college students that he's dealing with, and young men yeah. and women. And, and get it in front of mi you know, literally millions of people yeah. and give glory to God when s the vast majority of those people think, what a jerk. You know, yeah. I mean, why don't you just shut up and talk about football? No, he's, he realizes yeah. this yeah. stuff ha doesn't happen by accident. It isn't just because of hard work. There's right. other things involved here, too. Yeah. So I thought that was, that was nice. It was yeah. nice for a change because you hear so little of it anymore. Yeah especially on television, but uh, even in social circles, you know. But uh, this final movement is not going to only bring the church to full maturity and the stature, but it will, re it will end in the return of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The scriptures that uh, uh, Tim was quoting from, uh, reading from uh, James, or excuse me, from uh, Romans, uh, just, I mean, it just 
it, it just shocked me because those were scriptures that made me start thinking about all these things that we're talking about here this morning. Amen. So finally, what will eventually happen after all, after we do what we're here to do, amen, it will bring the kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. And at that time, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, yes. which will never be violated, which will never be demeaned or, yes. or diminished in any way at all. Amen. And it won't be a kingdom that is left to just anybody. It's ours to yeah. rule and to reign with Christ. Right. Amen. And so uh, it, it'll break in pieces, the, the scripture says, and consume every other kingdom, all other kingdoms. Amen. And it, this kingdom, will stand forever. Yes. Praise the Lord. Now, here's the deal. If we're going to understand God's plans and purposes for our generation, which I believe the last generation, yep. then we have to understand the kingdom of God and our part in that. Yep. Amen? So let's look at this. We've read these scriptures many times, but I'm going to go back over them uh, this morning. But Hebrews chapter 4, and let's read verses 1 through 11. Because we're at the place now... Well, we can't put things off anymore. I mean, if you do watch the news, you know what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us, or lest a promise left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. And while we're reading this, just keep in mind that Jesus is the Sabbath. He is the rest that we're talking about. Everything else was just pointing to this reality. All of this, the Sabbath laws and all that kind of stuff, that was all just shadows. Jesus is the revelation or the fulfillment of all of this. So, seeing that, therefore, it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So it, actually, if you read uh, uh, Hebrews, I think, 2, 3, 4, and 5, he uses the term today multiple times, over and over and over. Today, if today, if today, today, today. And so what he's trying to get our attention is that some generation is going to say, today, we're tired of waiting for tomorrow. We're going to take it today, amen. And so we've been so temporarily or temporally minded, amen, that we've, inter we've, we've kind of interpreted Scripture based in an incomplete way. Like it's futuristic or it's something that's going to happen later. We haven't looked at it as though it was about today. Like right. he wants to do it now. Amen. And so we're thinking and then believing that God is describing temporal things. Amen. The fact is, in reality, God is showing us things of spiritual substance. In reality, God is showing us now things, yes. today things. Uh, you're, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. But that's what he's doing. Because some generation is going to say, hey, this is for us. Yeah. Yes. It's always been there for any, whatever generation would take it. But we can see things, how the Reformation and things have taken place at, at, in the church itself. Just think about your own life. When you first come to know the Lord or when you were first a believer, think back to that time and how much you have learned and changed yes. your approach. Now, God is still God and none of that changes but what do we know today yes. about healing, about deliverance, about resurrection, about yeah. grace and all these yes. things that never entered my mind nope. 40 years ago? Nope. It was all about me doing everything I was supposed to be doing or catching hell for it. Yep. Amen. 
but there's so much there was so much more to that that I never dreamed even existed it just over time you're he opens a door here. He, he puts a hunger in your heart for something here. He, he puts a, a need, maybe. He doesn't put the need there, but he uses that need to bring you to a place of greater trust or, or more uh, you know, belief in, in what God can do and what God wants to do. Amen? So we're living in a relevant time of transition, as far as I'm concerned, in the church. God is showing us things that are for now, not for the next generation or for some generation off in the far distant future. Amen? Anywhere you find God's people, there is a general draw of the Spirit of God. I mean, I just talked about it briefly here, but just a little bit is, look, Tim, Don, others are sharing things all the time, and, and we're going, whoa, wait a minute, that's, that's God. That's got to be God, yeah. right? Yeah. We've been going along, and things have been working fairly well for us. I'm talking about as believers. You know what I mean? Yeah, we still got issues and we struggle with things. But it's not like it was for me 40 years ago where I was stressed all the time about every move I made and everything I said or every thought I had and every deed I did. and Just always thinking, what do I have to do to get yeah. God's attention or for God to love me or to want to be, have anything to do with me and all that kind of stuff. And you were constantly being told, you better be thinking that way because he's out to get you and he will. Yeah. You, know, you just don't know when. But you've got enough crap piled up that he could walk any time he wants to and he'd be justified in doing it. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way it was. So, and I, I guess we've thought that things were going pretty good because we're not under maybe the same kind of stress that we were 40 years ago or whenever we first got saved. And then it's like we hit a wall. Mm -hmm. Things aren't happening the way they ought to happen. Right. Not consistently, you know what I'm saying? I don't, look, I'm not trying to be negative here. I'm just being honest, okay? Right. And so we, it's like we hit this wall, and, but we act as though there isn't a wall. Because if we act like we are, then we're negative and we yeah. can't expect to get anything or have anything happen, amen? Yeah. But there's this discontentment. Now, I'm speaking for me, but I don't think I'm alone in this thing because I am, you know, I'm talking to people all the time and I'm hearing the same kind of vibes from other people, you know, maybe in different words. But something up to this point has escaped us. And we can't put our finger on it, but it's created this dilemma of transition, like there's got to be more. There's more to this than this. And I'm not demeaning God or whatever we've had. I'm just saying there's just something in me that says... There's, there's more. There's something else besides just this stuff we're doing to get, you know, to, to, to make life livable. Amen? But here's the deal. And what God has, has said to me is, you're not in a bad place. You know, you get a little frustrated or you get anxious because you're not seeing everything the way the scripture actually says that it is. And, and you're wondering, am I misinterpreting? I'm misunderstanding. And, and, Am I just screwing up? Am I not knowing what's going on? And, and what God has said to me is, you're in a good place. You're not in a bad place. Just because you're hungry, just because you're wanting to see more or experience more, that's not a bad place. That's a good place to be. Yeah. That's, that's where he wants us to be. Yeah. And if God has brought us to a time of discontentment, mm -hmm. it's so that we'll hunger for more. Yeah. Because he feeds the hungry. It's the hungry who get fed. Yeah. It's, it's those who are hungering and thirsting after God that receive God. Yes, Lord. Amen? So there's something that God wants us to see. And that will eternally change us and the way that we think. Yes. Romans 8, and we'll read verses 22 through 32. So we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Mm -hmm. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. And that's important. The first fruits, or the down payment, mm -hmm. or the seal. It's used in different ways. They're synonymous terms. So even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope? But if we hope for that we see not, 
then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, and to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? See, it's not that what we have known was wrong or that what we've known was not good. But really, Christ has been faithful to grow and to mature us in spite of us a lot of times, at least in my case. So that what we've known and what we've walked in doesn't satisfy the cry of our spirit. Ephesians 4, 13 through 23. Now we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to the sea. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So what God is saying is, in all of this is what we've come to is not a wall. You know, we've, it feels like we've hit a wall. Like this is, where, where else can we go? What, what, what else is there? I mean, Pentecost, we've gone through this, we've seen the miracles, we've seen signs and wonders, we've seen, but it's like, we, we can't get past this. We, there's, it's like there's more, but we can't get to it. Well, it's, it's not a wall at all, because that's what I'm thinking. I'm just, poof, you know, and I can't go any further, and I don't know how to get around it or over it or around, it just seems like that. Amen. But it's not a wall. It's a call, Tim, to take the next step. Praise the Lord. If you think back, just think over your own life. When you came to a place, whether it was Pentecost or whether it was charismatic or whether it was grace or whatever, it was, you reached a point where you had to say, okay, am I going on with this or I'm staying with what I've already had, what I've always heard, what mama believed and what daddy believed, what I, what I learned as a little kid or am I willing, is it a wall, or is it a step forward? Is it an opportunity for more of what God has for us? And that's what I think God is doing in 2020. It's a call to take the next step. I want you to look at this in Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 14. And I believe this is, personally, it's revelation, and I just think it's, God just wants to know how hungry are you? If you're, if you're hungry for just fries and a soda, that's what, that's what you get. But if you want the good stuff, I mean, yeah. if you want the, the steak or the lobster and the, you know, yep. then you better have an appetite. Yep. Oh, my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance.
let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. You know what a set of stairs is? I fell down one last week, so I know a little bit about stairs firsthand, praise the Lord. But seriously, our front uh, entrance, we're going to have to put a deck in or do something with the, the rise. It's not, not like it's supposed to be, and so it's, anyways, I've been thinking about stairs. And uh, here's the deal. He's in the stairs here, she says. And a set of stairs, and this probably isn't going to be revelation to anybody, but it's composed of a riser <coughs> and then a tread. And it's followed by another riser and another tread. Mm -hmm. And the riser is the part that lifts you to the next step. The place for your foot that's higher than the one you were on prior to that. It's not a wall. It's a call. Anybody ever get up in the night? And you don't have a night light or you don't turn the lights on yeah. and you <laughs> now it feels like a wall right yeah. but it may not be a wall at all it could be the stairs mm -hmm. it could be a in our case a cedar chest or something mm -hmm. who knows what but you can't see it it just you can't go any further right. right and that's what god was saying to me is look it's not a wall it's a step if you could see you would just take a step up to the next, your next step, in other words, isn't so much that way as it is that oh, way. Yeah. And when you go that way, you end up that way. Yeah. So, Philippians 1 and 6. And I'm just saying, it's not a wall. What we've come up against, what, what, what we're trying to get past isn't a wall. God says it's a step. It's a call. To take another step. He's got more for us. Yeah. I mean, every time we reach a place, we think, got it now. Grace, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And it's true. But we couldn't get to the next place without that, without understanding grace, without understanding the way we use the word of God. We can't go to the next place. There's a lot of people that are still struggling with stuff that we dealt with 30 years ago. Yeah. There's people that don't even believe in healing. Don't, that, that's all over with. God's not doing that anymore. So the reason we have it is because there came a time when we said, I, I, I want to believe that. I want that to be. Yeah. It's in here. It says it's here. It, 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 it talks about it. Yeah. So it looked like something was holding us back. Maybe it was the church that we attended or the, you know, the, the, the history that we were involved in. And then all of a sudden we decide, look, let's get out of the boat here. Let's take a step. Let's, let's see what it is. Let's try it. And that's when you start seeing miracles. That's when you start seeing things happen. And that opens you up to greater things that God wants to do. Is it consistent? No. It is not that it's not consistent because of God. It's not consistent because it's not consistent in us. In us. Yeah. Right? We, we have to enter into that rest. The rest is Jesus. It's the finished work. It's all been done. It isn't like he's, we're trying to get him to do something else for us. It's, he's trying to get us to enter in with the finished work, into what has already been done. Praise the Lord. So being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you yes. will perform it yes. until the day of Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. He started this work. No man comes to the Lord with, unless he's drawn by the Spirit. Amen. And as we yield to the Spirit, he gives us more. Yep. And so he's, that's what he's telling us here. Be confident of this thing. If you believe, God's not done. Amen. And he's going to perform. He started this good work in you and he will perform it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ or the yes. fullness of the church age. Yes. All right. So look, at, uh, let's go on in Philippians to th chapter three and verses 13 through 16. I've got a, you know, I'm kind of jumbling around here with the scriptures, but I want you to get them established so you know that I'm not just, this isn't just something I dreamed up one night and thought, well, oh, that's wild. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended him. Very scripture that he used earlier. This is Paul. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, 
you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now, look at, listen to what he's saying. Paul had some revelation, man. I mean, he had been in heaven. He had experienced Jesus' ministry firsthand from the Spirit of God by, by Jesus himself. He said, I don't, no, no man taught me this stuff. Yeah. This was the Lord. So he's saying, look, God will reveal. If there's anything that we're otherwise minded, in other words, as we're moving down through life and, and our religious experience, and I call it religious just simply for definition, but our relationship with God, we've grown, haven't we? We've all learned stuff. We've all, we're not thinking the same way we thought the day we first accepted Christ or believed in God or however, or whatever your initial beginning was. But God has continued to, as long as there was a hunger, as long as there was a desire, He continues to reveal to us. Yep. So nevertheless, we're to, we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. So however got me to here yeah. is the way I'm supposed to continue. I'm not supposed to get here and say, oh, I've arrived, praise the Lord. Yep. Right? No, He's saying, whatever got you here, Nathan, that's what's going to get you to the next place. Yes. You can't just stop at some point and say, well, I think we've got it now. I mean, it's, it's, it's everything I've understood up to this point, so it must be, this must be it. Now we just got to wait on God to do something. And that's what he's telling us. That putting things off to the future, waiting for God to do something that God's already done, gets you nothing except frustrated. All right. So nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom he also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Let's I, I, read this one more time because I've read this. I've preached from this. I've heard messages preached from this. And I think God's telling us something altogether different here. In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It's not the total inheritance. It's just the earnest. It's the down payment. And tell the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit that we have, what we received, was the earnest. Amen? Literally, the down payment of our full inheritance in the Lord. Yeah. So gifts, prophecies, tongues, interpretations, and everything that accompanies that were only the guarantee. To guarantee that God had given the full disbursement of the inheritance purchased by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's given it all. This is just what we got. Yeah. And how many of you know a huge portion of the church doesn't even have that? No. Now, I'm not demeaning what, you know, what we've experienced. I'm saying that there is so much more for us to receive. And to enjoy yes. because of the total provision purchased for us by yes. Jesus Christ. Yep. Now, according to the scripture, God is saying, if the down payment has been this powerful and glorious in our lives, he wants to take us to a realm that eclipses any place we've ever been at yes. this point. Yes. Thank you, God. So I'm going to share something with you. This is old Pentecostal stuff I used to teach. I taught Sunday school. I taught new converts courses and all of that stuff. But um, some of you be familiar with these things. But remember the dispensationalism. You know, uh, a lot of you don't hear a lot about it. But uh, the dispensations are periods of time that God has specific ways of dealing with mankind. Mm -hmm. And within that dispensation, that's the only way He's going to deal with them. Mm -hmm. It's a covenant thing. And so the first dispensation would be. Uh, innocence and that covenant was Edenic or because of Eden and it went that dispensation went from the creation to the fall mm -hmm. that was the dispensation of innocence the next dispensation that comes after the fall is the dispensation of conscience mm -hmm. and that was the Adamic Adamic covenant God made a covenant with man yeah. amen right 
after the fall. This is the second uh, dispensation and covenant because there's always a covenant with each dispensation. And that one lasted 1,500 years. It went from the fall to the flood. Okay? Then came the government, human government. That was the next dispensation. So you've got innocence, conscience, human government. And that was the Noahic covenant, or the covenant God made with Noah. Right? And that was for 500 years. It went from the end of the flood to the call of Abraham, or Abram. Mm -hmm. That covenant and that dispensation was the dispensation of promise, and the covenant was the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. Amen. And that went from Abraham for 500 years, from Abraham to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Yeah. And God gives another covenant, mm -hmm. the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, mm -hmm. and the dispensation of the law. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that dispensation ran from Sinai, from the giving of the law, to the Messiah or the coming of Jesus. 500 years. And then we come to grace. And it's amazing to me how we have been in a dispensation of grace for almost 2,000 years yes. and three-fourths of the church doesn't, yes. doesn't operate in it. Now I'm going to show you why. Martin Luther, when he was Catholic, this was the universal church after the first generation of the first hundred years, and, they, and then we got into the, uh, you know, the Roman emperors and others, you know, kind of dictating and, and dis deciding what the church would be and so on and so forth. And we come into the universal church and the Catholic church and developed all these other uh, isms and schisms and all the rest of the stuff. When in fact, along comes Martin Luther, who was a jerk in a lot of ways. He, he was anti-Semitic. He was, had a lot of issues. But God gave him a revelation that the just shall live by their faith. Yeah. Now look, let me, let me just back up for a second. Did he just find a Bible that had that in it? No, it, it had always been there. He just happened to be one that saw it and said, oh, the just are supposed to live by faith. Not by all these rituals we've been doing. and Not by all these acts of penance and all this other stuff. The just should be living by faith. It's, here, God said it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, then what? St same dispensation. Yeah. Still got the Catholic Church. And I'm not against Catholic. Half of my family's Catholic. I mean, they can be believers. They, they can trust in Christ. Same as anybody. I'm just saying. Right. What a huge difference there is between that and Protestantism. Oh, yeah. I mean, as you move on. But so they, it's the birth of Protestantism. Well, that was, you know, wow, we, we, we've arrived, right? No, the hell you had. Right? Because then comes Calvinism, yep. Baptists, yep. Methodists, yep. right? All of these 25, 30 years, 100 years, then another one comes along. Well, I didn't see, this, this, didn't know that. Well, let's start a church, right? Yep. It's just more revelation. It's just God trying to reveal Completely, but people stop. As yeah. soon as they find the thing that they think is revelation, bang. Then you start another church movement, and that's it for another 150, 200 years, yeah. maybe longer. <coughs> then comes Pentecost, just 100 and some years ago. Now, there had been isolated cases, but not widespread. So, bang, Pentecost, and, and now all of a sudden we're believing in the infilling of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and, and, and healings and deliverance and all that kind of stuff, right? So for a hundred and some years we've been doing that and most of the time we've been fighting about who was right and who was wrong. And then comes the charismatic movement. And I remember when we, when we were in Texas and I was assisting the pastor down there and the, uh, we, we lived in what had been the parsonage before they built the new church and it was right across the back basically the backyard, from the old original church, which was now a uh, charismatic church. <laughs> I can remember being so judgmental. I mean, seriously. I think, what the heck? What do these people think they're going to get? I mean, they're, they're idiots. They're, they, they actually put down, see, we dance in the spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Right? They actually had footprints. I'm oh, serious. It was like an Arthur Murray thing. Right? I can come home and think, just, what? 
we got to move out of this place because I'm expecting fire, flood, something that's going to just wipe this out, you know. But that's how critical I, I and, and I didn't know anything. I thought I did because I had some revelation that I'd never heard of before. You know, I mean, it was amazing, and it was true. But it wasn't all of it. It was just the new thing that I didn't know before. Right. And I embraced it, and I thought, nobody's getting this. You know, this is, God, give me this. Mm. And how stupid I was to not know that God had so much more than that one thing that I thought was everything. It was powerful. It was true, and it, and it was, you know, a beautiful revelation. But it was just a piece just part of what God was trying to say and what God was trying to do in my life. So what I'm saying is, what makes us think that we're the ones that have arrived? And that God doesn't have another Pentecost or another Charismatic or another whatever name you, we end up giving it when it's nothing more than just a greater revelation of God, a better understanding connection with God about what he's wanting to do and what he's trying to do in our lives. Right. I'm not looking to start a new movement. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for everything that God has. That's right. And I think he's looking for somebody to give it to yes, him. Because the fullness of time is important to God. Yes. He's got a plan and it's laid out and it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. The only thing he needs is access to this dimension. And yep. That's why we're here. Now if we won't open up to the things that we haven't experienced or haven't known, then God's going to have to wait for another generation. Mm -hmm. The fullness of time will be the generation that says, we'll take it. Yep. We want it now. Yep. Whatever the cost, yep. whatever the confusion may be, we want it. Yep. And I think that's what God has got us here for right now. Yep. A people who you could say have been kind of schizophrenic. You know, I mean, if you were talking about from a religious perspective, well, God, you were born a Methodist, you, you ought to be a Methodist. What the, what's wrong with you? you know, if you lost your mind, if you were Pentecostal, you ought to still be Pentecostal. And if you were this particular Pentecostal, you ought to still be that Pentecostal. I mean, what are you, aren't you afraid you're going to get into craziness? And, and, and No, no, I've got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, sure. He's leading and guiding me. Yeah. He's done a pretty good job of it so far. Yeah. Not, not because I helped him any. I was in the way most of the time. Yeah. But he still kept bumping me forward on the path that he wanted me to be on because he knew deep down in my heart, I want what God has. I just don't know how to go about getting it. I just don't know all the doors to open and how to get to it and around it and everything else. It's like Tim said, you know, I, I did a funeral for a, a relative by marriage, a young guy, and I was asked by the family to do it. I don't like doing funerals, to be quite honest with you. But I mean, it's, it goes with the territory. It's what you do. It's like marriages. I'm not even huge on, on doing marriages. I do them because I love the people that I work with. You know, I mean, it's part of what you do. It's not something I love to do. It's just it's awkward. And, you know, you've got to deal with all kinds of different personalities and people. And you don't know what, where they're coming from. I mean, I've had some fist fights break out at funeral <laughs> homes. Seriously, I mean, just crazy stuff. You don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, I, it was at a, a church large and fairly popular church. And they did the same thing to me, Tim. They wanted to know what college I went to, what Bible college I went to, you know, and what our beliefs were. I had to sign a paper and I had to write out some of the doctrines, you know, and so forth. I just thought the whole thing was so idiotic. It's a funeral for God's sake. Yeah. We're trying to honor somebody's life and, and bring some peace and some comfort to the family that's going to be without this individual now. And you're worried about my degree yeah. Yeah. in theology, and, I, and if I have to sit down and talk to you about this, we're not going to just, we're not going to agree. I knew that coming in, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm not holding that against you. You're wrong, but I'm not going to hold it against you, right? right? I mean, because that's what, basically, that's what he's telling me. Unless you agree with me, you're not right. You're, you, yeah. you can't be right if you're, if you're not in agreement with me, and that's, that's not true. Right. I mean, that's where we came from. If that's my attitude, then I better be right because I'm not, I'm not going anywhere else. That's all I'm going to have. And God told me, and I've shared it with you many times, when I left the church, when I left the organization I was licensed and ordained in and resigned the church, that's what God told me. Unless you pick this thing up and read it as though you've never read it before and you don't know what it all means, 
then you're not going anywhere but where you're already at. And I wasn't content where I was at. Because they were wanting me to sign agreements that I would only say this and only preach this and never deviate from that. So I had a choice of either lying to them and going ahead and doing what I was doing anyway or just leaving the ministry. And that's exactly what I did. And I think God is still saying the same thing. It isn't that he has got a new plan. It's the same plan. The dispensation of grace isn't going to change until the return of Jesus. And then it will only change because we'll be in the dispensation of the kingdom of God on earth. So within this dispensation, and I've already told you a dozen things that have happened within this dispensation that were different from what it was when we started. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, from my perspective, I looked at things that were in, in uh, you know, uh, 1980. Yeah. And that was altogether different than what it was in 1950-something when I was going to Sunday school. Yeah. I mean, what I, heard, what I knew in 1980 was a whole other thing. I mean, it was a whole different reality. Well, the truth is, 2020 is a completely different reality than what I knew in 1982. Now, the things that I knew in 1980, they're still valid. They're still true. Yeah. It's just that at that point, that's all there was. You, could, yeah. you weren't going to go any further than that. That's had to be the final truth. That was the only truth. Yeah. And that's had to be what you live by. So the, the frustration and the, 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 the sense of failure on my part, and I, I admit that I felt that way when I left the church, was not failure at all. Mm-hmm. It was the next step. Mm-hmm. It just didn't look like a step. It looked like a wall. It looked like yeah. it's done. You know, it looks like I'm, I'm finished with this and I can just move on and get back into sales or do something else to make a living, right? Yeah. But God never stopped. The hunger never left. No. The desire. And I'm not talking about, you know, lying on the floor and weeping and crying and moaning and all that stuff. That's happened, but that isn't what I'm talking I'm talking about just a, yes. an unrest. Something in me that says, man, there's more than this. I know that there is, and, yes. and, and I, don't, I don't want to miss it. Right. I didn't come this far no. to just say, gee, uh-huh. really close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Close, right? It's only good in hand grenades and horseshoes. Yeah. And I ain't playing with either one, so right. I want the real deal. I want yes. what God has. Right. Praise the Lord. So he, let's go back to Hebrews uh, 4, 1 through 3. So with that in mind, I mean, just keep that in mind. We are in a dispensation that started 2,000 years ago at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the birth of the church. Same dispensation. We're in the same one today. And we don't know half of what they knew 1,950 years ago or whatever it was in that first century church. Because so much has been lost. So much has been hidden. So much has been buried. So much has been taught around and over and beyond. God has gradually, person at a time, few people, a handful of women in a Bible study in Kansas or someplace, and the Holy Spirit falls on them. And yeah. Why? Because they were hungry. And they believed what they read. They read Acts, and they said, yeah. why aren't we experiencing yeah. this? Why aren't we having this? Yes. Nothing's changed. We're in the same dispensation that the book of Acts was written in. So that's what, that's what I'm saying. There are, why should we think that we are the ones that finally got to the end of this thing. There is no end to it. The end is when Jesus comes and we ought to be growing and learning and experiencing yes. the presence and the power of the Spirit of God all the way up to that moment. Yes, yes. We're here for a reason and we are here to bring about the fullness of time for the church. Yes. For the church to be everything it's supposed to be before Jesus comes back for it. And if we're not willing to hunger a little bit and to to get outside the box, you know what I mean? To to, to push the envelope a little bit. You know, I know what they say. You can push the envelope all you want. It's still stationary. (laughs) But I'm serious about this. (laughs) Amen? Because that's how it feels. We're pushing, but we're not. We're still stationary. But God is saying, if you'll hunger, I'll feed you. If you'll be thirsty, yes. I'll give you to drink. Right? Yes. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Praise the Lord. Somebody for a long time was praying, oh God, is there not some way that I can understand righteousness and 
free access to you without shame and guilt and fear. I mean, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people pleaded. They didn't know what to do. They beat themselves. They, they suffered in all sorts of weird, strange rituals and everything else. For one reason, because they wanted God. But they couldn't get out of the box. They couldn't get past whatever their religious teaching had been. And so they just put more on themselves thinking that that's going to make something happen. No, it's the more we give to God, the more we expect from God, the more we get from God. I, I got into the Pentecostal church and, and the, the revelation that I had by accident. I didn't know anything about Pentecostal. In fact, to, in my mind, they were all weirdos. Praise the Lord. Well, they were happy to have one more weirdo, so I just joined right up with them. But I'm just saying, I, I, it wasn't because I was attracted to their way of having church, if you want to know the truth. I was, it was quite awkward, and I wasn't comfortable with it. And it took a move of God for me to be able to sit in a Pentecostal church and actually participate and be part of it. Because I was embarrassed for them. Now, I, I know, look, it was pride, I suppose, or just self-consciousness, or whatever you want to call it, which is just another part of pride. But. So it wasn't like I went running to this thinking, man, I really want to be a part of this deal. No, I went not knowing what it was because it was a brand new church without a sign. We just knew it was a big church and it was two blocks from our house, right? That's why we went. That first service was an eye opener. Whew. Praise the Lord. Well, they got to shouting and running and leaping and Allison was just a baby at the time and we'd taken her to the nursery and it was it was a big church, and you had to go all the way around. You know, it was a central deal. So you've got to go get her. I mean, God knows what's going on in that nursery. I mean, there's people out there, and they're hallelujah, and they're rolling, and they're shouting, and they're jumping, and we're going, oh, my God. And we let them take our daughter. She's going, what, what's wrong with us? This, this is the wrath of God. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying, but look, there was truth there. There was Biblical truth. So I thought, hey, jump shout all you want to. I'm here. I'm learning something that I never knew before, and I know it's coming from God. Yeah. And it wasn't too much longer before I was right out there yeah. going with him, praise the Lord. But I'm just saying, how many lives have gone and never budged yeah. from the initial story they heard in Bible school as a kid or what mom told them or dad? Just because... They were satisfied. Yeah. Just enough to get me a ticket to heaven. Yeah. And God has so much more. That is, that's the small thing. That's the thing that's already done. Yeah. This is about bringing that here. Yes. Not getting us there, but getting heaven here. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. There's nothing else. There's nothing left to be done as far as God's concerned. The only thing left is for us to get a revelation of it, for us to understand what it is that he has done and what is ours. And the only way you can get that is by entering in to rest, just resting in God, trusting in God. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, uh, 9 through 14, Peter. Ephesians 1, verses 9 through 14. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, how many of you understand all the mystery? If you do, come on, we need to go have lunch, praise yeah. the Lord, because I'd like to get in on it. We know some stuff. But having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Praise the Lord. So it's because the fullness of the inheritance is even more powerful and more glorious than anything we've ever heard about or experienced or believed possible. Yeah. Amen? Think about this. All of the amazing things that we've seen God do in the realm of healings or miracles or financial breakthroughs or whatever you might have experienced or saw, or saw someone else experience or what have you, he says, are not to be compared with the greater glory that lies ahead. I'm not saying God will stop healings or stop miracles. This is a done deal. This, this is, these are things given. In fact, I believe he's going to bring them to an even greater manifestation as we move into the next dimension or the next realm of faith. So let's again, let's go back to Ephesians 1, verses 17 through 23. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We know what the earnest is. We know what the down payment is, but he's praying that we would know the fullness of that inheritance. Here, not, not in heaven, because you don't need it in heaven. Nope. You need it here. Yep. The world needs it here. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So, praise the Lord. God promises that we will be overcomers. Right? No weapon formed against you. You see it over and over and over. He says, you will be overcomers. Yep. You shall overcome. Be of good cheer. You, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And you are in Christ. Yes. Right? So God said those that overcome would get something. And what is it they get? Hidden manna. Praise the Lord. For those that overcome, God gives hidden manna. I'm telling you, we're in the days, I believe this, of hidden manna. John 6, verse 50 through 58. So somewhere in the scheme of this dispensation, or in the time of this dispensation, God said, <clears throat> there'll be overcomers, and they're going to find hidden manna. Praise the Lord. This is the bread, Jesus said, which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. So we can feed on something of Christ that we've never tasted yet. That's what I'm getting from this. We've 
fed on Jesus. We have eaten him. We have drank his blood. We, it's what we do with communion, but it's what we do every time we come to the word of God. He is the word. The word was made flesh. Yes. And we, he said, you don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we're eating yes. symbolically Christ. And he's telling us we can feed on something of Christ that we have never tasted yet. Hidden manna. And I'm saying this. My experience in Pentecost was hidden manna. I knew there was a God. I knew Jesus died for my sins. But I didn't know anything that they were going to reveal, that, I, that would be revealed to me. There was hidden manna. There was words that were hidden. They were here. I just never saw them. I never understood them. And a hunger that I couldn't even define at the time. I was just, we were just in chaos because I'm feeling mess, you know, functioning, but still a mess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hunger was there. I just didn't know how to define it. God knew what I needed, and he got me to the place where I could get what I needed. Right. He didn't give me everything I needed. He just gave me enough to get me moving in the right direction. Yeah. I thought it was the destination. <clears throat> God said, no, this is just a starting point. Yes. One step in the journey. If you'll take the step, you'll go up one step yep. to another level. Not only will you go forward, you'll go higher. Yes. And if you'll take that step, it may feel like you've reached a wall again. But stay with me. Yep. There's another step. And as long as you're willing to take the next step, yep. there'll always be another stair there to climb. There'll always be another revelation. There'll always be yes. more of God Free. for me. For all of us, amen? God hasn't brought us to the end of a realm for us to die here. He hasn't brought us to these steps and to this place that seems like a wall to bring us to frustration or distraction or desperation. Philippians 3, 11 through 14. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I also I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So he's brought us to this place so that there will be uh, a hunger. There will rise up in our spirit a determination to move beyond being satisfied with the me mediocrity of coming to only part of our inheritance. Mm -hmm. To come to the fullness of the manifestation of God's kingdom in us. And I'm telling you, the only reason I'm doing this today is because... There was something in me wanting to do it. There was a greater part of me that didn't want to do it. And Sally will tell you, I just wrestled with the whole thing, didn't want to really be in it. I liked being around the church. I liked being involved in the church. I didn't really want to be preaching and pastoring, you know. Mm -hmm. But there was a hunger for more of God. And I didn't know where the separation was. I didn't know where I would say, okay, I won't, I'm not going to do that. I'll do anything else, but I'm not going to do that. The very fact that I experienced as many things as I have, and I'm not saying this in any braggadocious kind of way, because it was all, it was just God. It wasn't because I was doing something special. I stumbled into things. Mm -hmm. But I allowed God to use me. Yes. I, I put myself in a place where God could use me. I didn't think it would ever amount to anything. I figured, in fact, I just figured it out, just be here an assistant, teach some Sunday school and stuff, and that'll be good enough. But God is always putting another stare out there for you. He's not going to make you. He doesn't put a gun to your head. He doesn't shove you up the stairs or down the stairs. He just puts it there. And you determine whether it's a wall or a step. Yep. Yeah. And that's where we're at. I believe that's where we are today. Yes. The church in general, but I'm not as concerned about the church in general as I am about us specifically. Oh, yes. God can deal with them, with their people, and however yes. they got to do it. But I'm just saying he has brought us to this place so that there will rise up in our spirit a determination 
to move beyond being satisfied with mediocrity, yes. with being satisfied with what we know. Right. I'm not calling it medio mediocre. I don't mean to sound like I'm demeaning what the power of God is. I'm just saying there is so much more. Yes. It would make this look yes. insignificant right. in comparison. That's what he said. Right. What you know, he said you're going to think that was kindergarten. Because yep. what I've got for you is advanced math, trigonometry, yeah. physics, you know, name it. Anything you don't know anything about, that's what I got. Yes. And I can give it to you in a way that you can understand it and take advantage of it. Praise the Lord. He's going to do this because we've only received part of our inheritance. And God isn't withholding anything from us. Mm. Just like you had to believe in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. That opened a door to the way God operates in people's lives mm -hmm. that does not change in this dispensation. When you step up to another wall, you go, I'll believe it, Lord. I'll believe it. That's faith. Mm -hmm. See, the whole, the whole country missed this. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying I think this is just me talking now, but I think if Israel would have entered in yep. to the promised land when they had the opportunity, yep. <laughs> there may have never been a dispensation of the law. Right. We might have moved right into the Messianic <laughs> covenant. Yep. We might have had grace right then. Yes. Amen. Jesus may have come at that moment. Yes. But they, because of unbelief, they couldn't enter in. I get it, it was a geographic thing for them. But that was just simply because it was pointing to a greater reality. That was physical stuff, and he was pointing to a spiritual reality that was Christ. The promised land, our promised land. Amen? He provides for all of our needs. He is our source. <coughs> He's the land that flows with milk and honey. Yes, he is. He's the houses we didn't build. Yes. Right? He's the, he's the, the, the fields that we didn't plant. He's everything we need. That's my point is that. And that's what he's saying. Somebody, there's some generation is going to say, I'll, I'll take that. I'll go. I'm coming. I'm crossing over right now. I don't care if anybody else comes with me or not. I don't care about the giants. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about the laws. I don't care about the, the, the world that's going on around me and all the rest of this crap. I'm going. Amen. And I'm going to find rest in Jesus. And he's going to provide for every need I have, even the needs that I don't know I'm going to have. Praise the Lord. Romans 8, 14 through 24. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Yes. Now, if we're joint heirs with Christ, what was, has anything been withheld from Jesus? Mm -hmm. He's seated in heavenly places right now. Mm -hmm. Right? No Nothing thing. was withheld from him. No. Resurrection life. I mean, he, he, that, that's just it. He got it all. Yes. We saw him. Uh, you know, in our mind's eye, because of the Word of God, walk in that reality. Yes. And it was amazing to him that they couldn't believe. Because it was so natural to him. Yes. Why? Because he only said what his father said. He only did what his father did. He wasn't being distracted by the, anything other than the promises of God. If thou canst believe. Now, damn it, we say that all the time. And I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be emphatic here. Because yep. I'm an ex-Marine and an old fool. <laughs> Sometimes I use words that I shouldn't use that are not as emphatic as I think they are. They're just disturbing. But nevertheless, I'm saying, hey, yes. if we did what he did, we'd have what he had. Yes. yes. I'm not saying we're not, we're, we don't have eternal life. I'm not saying we're, we're not going to go to heaven. I'm saying that was never the main issue. No. 
We were already in Christ before the foundation of the world. This wasn't about us getting to there. It was about their getting to here. And some generation, now we've had bits and pieces, but it's because we haven't come to the fullness of time where, where we have believed that anything is possible with God. Literally anything. In fact, everything. Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and have children and heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. <laughs> He's the heir of every, the world. He has everything. Yes. And we're joint heirs with Him. We're not sub-heirs. No. We are joint heirs. Yes. We are like two identical twin brothers. Yes. And when the parent dies, bang, they both get their share. They split it. There it is. Yes. We got it. Amen. If children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified, also glorified together. What is the suffering? It isn't just the world. It's the suffering of believing yeah. in spite of our natural way of living yes. and thinking. And, and, and even yes. religion has poured that stuff into us and validated, amen, a lot of the just natural beliefs that we had. Instead of building us up in the right. faith uh, and, and the Word of God, they build us up in more guilt and shame and fear. Right. Making us dependent on governments. Yep. You know, I have my preferences when it comes to governing and, and certain laws and, and things. But the truth is, they, don't, they do not uh, define me. No. no. Whoever's in there is in there. I'm trusting God because I know everyone I'm can be a screw-up once they get in yeah. there. I've seen too many of them. They have some good qualities, but they all got some bad qualities. Why? Because they're human beings. And very, very few are true Christians. Thank God for any that come along are believers in God and believers in Christ. I'll take it anytime, anywhere, anyhow. But I'm not foolish enough to think that they're going to believe the way I believe God has for us to go. Because if they did, they probably wouldn't be in politics in the first place. But I'm just saying for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yes. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know the whole creation groaneth and travails. That's what we're seeing. It's not political strife. It's, no. it's demonic. It's, yes. it's the whole creation is travailing for this fullness of time. Amen. For the church to rise up and begin to establish the kingdom of God that will take care of all the other kingdoms yes. that are so confounded. And, screwed up. Yeah. and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, which have the down payment. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. What are we groaning for? We're groaning for the whole payment. We're, we're groaning for the payoff. For, for not just the earnest, but for the entire inheritance. Yes. Waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? See, God is bringing us into a realm of kingdom operation. Where we are going to see the king... See his throne and the lordship and realm of intimacy with him that goes beyond anything that we have ever known. I and my father are one. And that's what I'm talking about. Jesus said there'll be a generation before I return in the flesh that will reflect me as I was here. In other words, we'll be walking in our inheritance. And let me just tell you this. I would be surprised if it was a huge movement. Because from what I've seen historically and experienced even personally, the bigger they are, the less God has to do with them. Because he don't want them saying, well, it was our religious teaching and our school and this thing that did it and that thing that no. He's going to do it for somebody, as Tim said, someone that nobody expects it to come from. Right. So they'll have to have faith in God and not in man. 
So they can't just look at a big edifice with 10,000 people there and say, well, that's got to be God. I mean, come on, look at that. No, he's going to look at a little place with yeah. 25, 30 people, amen, yes. without, with some weird kind of teaching and yeah. weird teacher, amen, and, all, and, and say, I think I'll use that. Why? Yes. Because then it'll have, they'll have to believe that it's God because yes. they'll know that it couldn't have been them. Yes. If they could have done it, they would have done it 30 years ago. And I'm not saying it would just be us, but I'm saying this is the kind of thing that God does. This is the kind of people that He uses. When He called me in the ministry, I was the last person in the world that should have ever been in the ministry. And I mean, many times since then, I've thought the same thing. What were you thinking, Lord? I think what He was thinking was, I'd like to show you something, Nathan, that I can use an idiot, a rebellious, hard-headed, stubborn, selfish person to do what I want done. Yeah. And all I need is just a little bit of cooperation. Yeah. And I've even failed at that many times. But the truth is that's all of us. What it is, yep. I mean, if we're honest, yep. it is. what was he thinking when he called me? Because yep. he did call you. Yes. You didn't just wake up one morning and say, I think I'll try Jesus. No, no the Spirit Christ. drew you to him or you would have never come to him. That's right. God doesn't, he doesn't stop in midstream. He doesn't change his plan for your life or his dispensations. Whatever that covenant is that you have, and the covenant you have is Jesus Christ himself, yeah. amen, and the dispensation of grace, it's all there is. It's, it's, not going to, it's not going to be something else. It's just going to be this to the hundredth degree. It's going to be yes. this intense and powerful. So much so that when Jesus revealed it, Don said it today, they couldn't believe it. They, they, they said, what the heck is going on here? What kind of person is this? We know he's human. We, we've seen him go to the bathroom. I mean, we've eaten with him. We, we, we grew up with his family. We, we've known him. and he, We know this guy. But what the heck? Gets up in the middle of a storm and says, peace be still. And it's like, bang, they just shut the whole thing off and it's just done. Lepers? Everybody else is running from him and he's running to him? Yeah. Woman with the issue of blood. If I could just touch the hem of it. He said, your faith has just made you whole. You know what he said to her? You believed like I believe. That's why you got healed. Yeah. Not because you touched me, but because you believed in what I stand for. You believed yeah. in the God that heals. You believe yes. that if I could just get to him, he'll heal me. Yes. Praise That's the Lord. Right. We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. But what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? Praise God. God's bringing us into a realm of kingdom operation yep. where we will see the king. Yes. We're going to see the manifestations yes. of the king. We're going to have the experience of the fullness yes. of our inheritance before we leave here. Yes. Yes. Now, if you don't believe that, Jesus said, I'm coming back for a church yes. without spot and without wrinkle. Now, he wasn't saying that we would all be in lockstep and, and never, you know, swear a word come out of our mouth or, or, or you know, smell alcohol on somebody's breath or any, any of that stuff. Right. He said, you're going to come into the fullness of yes. why you're here. Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One day Jesus was on a mountain and he began to preach and to teach. Praise the Lord, I'm going along here. And it's what we know as the Beatitudes. The attitudes we need to be in. Attitudes that will teach us how to receive and dispense the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, he said, you're blessed when you're hungry. I mean, it sounds totally contradictory to anything naturally, right? How can somebody that's, going, that's hungry be blessed? Yeah. I mean, you think you'd be blessed when you're full, right? No, he said, because he's relating this is all about God. It's not about natural things. And he said, when you're hungering and thirsting for God, that's the person that's blessed. Why? Because God responds to that hunger. Yeah. Praise the Lord. See, it's a blessing to 
be hungry in the times that we live in. I mean, just think about it. To be hungry for God in 2020, that's rare. Most people have just kicked him to the curb, and now it's whatever the government can get for me or whatever I can get for myself, and, you know, just try to be a good person. Get along if you can. If you can't, then kill him. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to be hungry for God today. And you're blessed when you're poor in spirit, he said. And that doesn't mean that we go around moping and, oh, 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 everything happens to me and nothing works. It's just being aware of an acute need for God that nothing else can fulfill. Again, I'm not talking about we spend 24 hours every waking moment thinking, oh, no, I'm saying we live our lives with the expectation that God is going to do what God said he would do. And he's not going to do it based on my goodness, based on my hunger, based on my belief that God is capable and desirous of doing these things. If there's a sense of poverty in us toward God, it's a desperation that moves us to find him in a greater way than we ever have before. Rich in the knowledge of God, in in the presence of God, in the power of God. Amen. I'm telling you this morning, you're in a good place. If you're, if you're hungry, if you feel like you've hit the wall, it's not a bad place. You are in a good place. Yes. You're in the place that God wants you to be because yes. it's where God can react and respond to you. Yes. Amen. Song of Solomon 2.14, if you will again. I'll quickly wrap this up. And we're going to take communion here this morning. Start the year off right. Praise the Lord. Oh, my dove, thou art in the cleft of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. So he's brought us to the secret place of the stairs, not to a wall, but to a stair, where we can hear his voice. Praise the Lord. He said, when I bring you to this place that you thought was a wall, and you take the next step and realize it's taken me up, You're going to be in a place where you can hear me. You're going to come closer to me. And you're going to begin to hear my voice. And that's going to change everything. You know, we've spent too much time waiting to hear somebody else's voice about what God said to them. We're in the time. I'm telling you, we're in the time now. That stuff's over with. God God is not interested in another big name evangelist or he's interested in the body his body hearing his voice and working in unison together amen as a believer as believing members of his body praise the lord hebrews 4 1 through 3 again peter jesus our rest enter into his rest he said and here's the deal Lest the promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached to them didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith. Well, what gospel was preached to them? The same one that was preached to us, Jesus Christ. Yeah. It was just preached in a different way. It was preached in signs and, uh, you know, uh, shadows, types and shadows, I should say. And now it comes to Jesus here. But it's the same gospel. We're preaching the same thing. So Jesus is our rest. He is our Sabbath. And here's the deal. So I don't know how I can do it. God has never, ever required anything of anybody but that he first revealed himself in their midst. Amen. He never asked me to to be a part of the Pentecostal church until he revealed to me he was there. Now, he wasn't that church, but he was there in that church because there were people there that believed. He didn't ask me to do something until he revealed to me that he was involved in it. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? If he's asking us this, it's because that's where he is. Amen. Amen. Christ is the remedy for any problem, for every problem. God always supplies the provision before the need for that provision appears. We don't know it because we're operating right here. But he's already got the answers. I mean, uh, he didn't make cows and then decide, ooh, they're going to need something to eat. I better make some grass. No, he made the grass. And then he put the cows here, right? That's how he does everything that way. He doesn't ask something of us that he hasn't already 
made provision for us right. in that thing. So if he's asking us to be the generation yeah. that ushers in the return of Jesus, then he's already made the provision yeah. in us, the hunger, yeah. the yeah. desire, the belief that it will happen for us, yes. or, he, or he wouldn't be asking us to do it. I wouldn't have it in me this morning to think that or to want that if he hadn't already put something in me to say, hey, I, I can fix this thing. If, you, if you'll go for it, I've got what you need. Yes. Praise the Lord. So through the revelation of Jesus, we are endued with power from on high to overcome any and every hindrance. Praise the Lord. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God or the woman of God or the person of God can be fully completed and capable of carrying out whatever it is God has for them. I'm paraphrasing there, but it's, that's what he's saying. You, I have, I've given you this so that you can be everything I designed you to be. Yes. If you'll use this, yes. you'll be what I called you to be. You'll have your inheritance. You'll be fully furnished with everything that you need. Praise the Lord. One more scripture, and then we're going to go to communion. Uh, John 14 and verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Yes. And look at this. God, that greater works has always baffled me. How in the world would we do greater works than Jesus? Why? Because he goes to his Father. Sends back the Holy Spirit, the earnest, right, of our inheritance. And if we'll believe the way Jesus believed, we'll receive the entire inheritance and we'll do greater works than Jesus did. Amen. I'm telling you, somebody's going to believe this. Yep. And whoever that person is or whoever those people are, are the ones that are going to experience it. Yes. And I didn't live 40 years, uh, you know, struggling because of my own stupidity and stubbornness to just want to die and right. say, okay, well, he lived 40 years and he was a preacher and he wasn't a bad guy. Somebody might say that. Somebody that didn't know me real well. No, I, I want to I experience yes. what it was I was put here to experience. I don't yes. want to be one of these guys standing in the balcony looking down here saying, go, man, I hope you can get it. I should have, but, you know, come a little short. No, I want to leave here with my ticket punched that I did what I was, what I was here for to do. What my reason was for being here. And I think it's to show the glory of God for this world to see God. Not me, you know, what I'm saying. I'm not saying, I don't want, you know, a statue for me someplace. I'm saying that's where we all are. This just happens to be what I'm doing. I'm preaching. But that doesn't make a bit of difference as far as God's concerned. We're all in this thing together. We all have the same gifts. We all have the same inheritance. We all have the same God, the same Jesus. Praise the Lord. Greater works. Hey, I'm buying that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay. I know, I know me, but he said it. I'm, all I got to do is believe it. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. So let's, what do you say this morning we're going to take hidden manna? Right? We're going to have communion here. But let's, let's think about it this way. What we're doing is saying, when I take that cracker, that wafer, whatever, I'm taking in Jesus into me. Right? I, I'm... It's intimacy, in, into me, see, yeah. Jesus. I'm going to take that wafer, that thing, and, and in my mind I'm saying, this is not transubstantiation, I'm not getting into the Catholic thing, I'm just saying, I'm recognizing symbolically what I'm doing is being one with Jesus. Yes. I'm taking, I'm eating the finished yes. work of Christ. Yes. Healing. Yes. Deliverance, prosperity, yes. signs, wonders, miracles. Yes. All of those things are in this hidden manna. Yes. Amen? It's manna. And yeah, we're looking at it. We're seeing it. But 
What's in that thing is hidden. What's yeah. in that is the power of God himself. And he says, if you can believe, yeah. you're going to do greater works than I did when I was yes. a man on earth. And that's the reason for communion. It's to change the way that we think about ourselves, about our environment, and most importantly, about our God. Amen? So when you take that, as often as you do it, he says, do it in remembering me. Remember what I did. Remember what I was. Remember in the natural, I'm saying. When you drink my blood, this is the blood for the new covenant. The new covenant, church, the covenant of grace. The dispensation of grace and the covenant of, of being saved, of being in Christ. Amen. The covenant. Amen. Of God. The church. I don't want to just, I don't want this to be the church. I want this to be the church. I want this to be the church. So when you take it and when you drink it, take the finished work. Believe it. Receive it. And walk in it. Amen. Say, well, it's, that's, it's simple. It's all symbolism. It's all symbolism. He just gives us something tangible that we can touch and feel and taste so that we can hopefully transform our mind. You know, to be... To be conformed is a physical thing. Right? It's extra. I can conform to any environment I'm in, basically. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe not the ocean, but, you know what I mean, different social settings and yeah. cultural deals. I can conform. I can figure out what, okay, this is what they do. I mean, that's what I did when I got into the church, the Pentecostal church. I conform. Yeah. I mean, I got the long sleeve shirts and, mm-hmm. right? I mean, haircuts and shaved and took everything off. Right? I conformed. But he said, look, I don't want you to be conformed to this world. In other words, I don't want you buying into this world. I want you to be transformed. That's from the inside out. That's by the Spirit. So transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what God's after. He's after this because he knows this will control everything else. Now, I'm not, we're born again. We're saved, right? It's not a question of whether I'm spiritually alive in Christ. It's a question of whether or not I can understand that well enough to make it a reality in anything else that I'm doing. That's why I've got to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. What we did in the church basically was try to conform to the church and then think that everybody's going to look at us because we look so different and they're going to want to be into a part of that. And the truth is they looked at us and thought, oh, my God. I mean, I've heard this said before, but it's absolutely true. The preachers look like they just walked out of, you know, Botany 500 or some, you know, whatever they are. I don't watch it, read a lot of those magazines, but men magazines, you know, style and stuff. Right? I mean, the Rolex watches and the three-piece suits and the, you know, fancy shoes and big cars. I mean, Lincolns and Cadillacs and all that stuff. And, and the wives look like Granny Clamp. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, they had to wear the long old dresses. And <laughs> no makeup. You say, they had that glow. They didn't have a glow. It was a shine. They didn't have any makeup on. Come on. Praise the Lord. But anyway, I'm just saying, we conformed to that, right? Because we, it was, we identified with them because of the belief, because of Christ. So we conformed to all the other crazy stuff. Had nothing to do with it. When what God was wanting us to do was get... A revelation of him and then be transformed yeah. by that revelation. And the truth is, I'm looking at people, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. I mean, we came from that. We, yeah. we, we could have easily been there because it was, there was truth there. There was, there was some safety and, and comfort in some ways, although there was a lot of paranoia too. But there was a, a sense of there's safety in numbers. There, there, you, you have acceptance, you know, you're, you're, you fit. Yeah. Well, i got to tell you, Jesus never fit anywhere. No. But he, everywhere he went, people began yes. to be transformed. Yep. He didn't conform to them, but they were transformed by him. Yes. And that's what we're after. So praise the Lord. If uh, Toby, if, if you and John will just wear you guys out today, if you'll come out and pass out the uh, elements here.
chicken. Like I was drinking whiskey all night. Who funds it? Grapes too. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> he says, "Is this lunch?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "I thought it was going to be dinner too." <laughs> Gone a little long here. Okay, praise the Lord, everybody. And he said, when he had given thanks, Jesus said, he broke the bread and said, "Take, yes. eat." This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament or New Covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. Every time we do it. Do it in remembrance of the finished work that yes. I commit into your hands. Yes. Enter in to me, he says. Yes. Rest in faith. It's ours. Yes. It's the finished work. It's a gift. It's an inheritance that belongs to us. Amen. And if we'll believe it, we will be the generation yes. to experience it. Yeah. The hidden manna of God is for us because we are overcomers through Jesus Christ. Yes, Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you so much for your patience. I know we went really long this morning, but it's the first of the year, and I think we needed to kind of set the... the the tone for where we're going this year, and I do believe this is what God has yes. for us. I think we're, we're, we're ready for God to begin to reveal things to us yes. that we've only dreamed yeah. about. Amen. amen. And experience them in this, in this upcoming year, amen, amen, in a way that's going to not only transform our lives, but the lives of the people that we yes. come into contact with. So keep praising the Lord and believing, amen, in the hidden manna. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year.